Hello, and welcome to Yada Yada Law School. My name is Greg Schill, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Iowa College of Law. I'm also the Art Vandelay Dean and Kenny Rogers Roasters Foundation Chair in Business Law at the Yada Yada Law School, a fake law school where real law professors teach classes about nothing. Speaking of fake law school, thank you for your patience as we work through some technical challenges. We had no idea anyone would actually be interested in this. We have classes about nothing planned all summer. You can find details and sign up at yadayadalawschool.com. All classes are free of charge, but you must sign up. Our first class today on Seinfeld and property law will be taught by Professor Sarah Bronin of the University of Connecticut School of Law. But before I turn it over to her, I wanna say a word about what we had in mind when we conceived this and what we're asking from you. Now, for the most part, we wanna keep this light. We've all had enough heavy news this year already. And let's be real, you're wearing sweatpants right now, and so am I. But we aren't doing this purely for fun. In the past few months, our country has been devastated by the coronavirus, which has already claimed more than 100,000 American lives. There's a limit to what we as law professors can do directly to address the medical side of this crisis. But we thought we could maybe combine our knowledge of law, our teaching experience, and our shared love of Seinfeld to do some good. Uh, we decided to do this for two reasons. First, to give people trapped at home during the pandemic something to enjoy and hopefully to learn from. Uh, and second, to try and help out those in need by raising money for charity. To that end, we have partnered with Legal Services of New York City to raise money for COVID-19 relief in the epicenter of the pandemic, New York. On our page, yadayadalawschool.com, you will find a link to donate. We will also drop a link to that uh, in this webinar. We ask that you chip in $6 today. $6 because that is the price of the marble rye that Jerry was unable to buy uh, lawfully and ended up stealing. Now, when we put this program together, we knew about COVID-19, but I also want to acknowledge a second phenomenon that's unfolding right now. And that is the brave work of millions of Americans who are coming together around the country as one for a time-honored tradition to petition their leaders for change, specifically change in how law enforcement treats African Americans. This is vitally important. And uh, I would submit that it is even more important for people who look like me uh, to vocally support this change, which is so desperately needed in our country. Now, as it happens, your professor this week is not only a nationally renowned property scholar, but a local advocate for reform to undo the harmful effects of zoning and residential segregation. It's my pleasure now to turn the mic over to Professor Sarah Bronin, the junior mint professor of law at Yada Yada Law School and the Thomas F. Galvin Chair in Real Property Law at the University of Connecticut School of Law. Thank you, Professor Bronin. Hi, everybody. How, is, how are you today? Um, thank you, Greg, for putting this together. Uh, I'm really excited to get started. And uh, with that, I think I will do just that. All right, so I'm sharing my screen. Hopefully you guys can all see it. Just wanted to give you a quick introduction um, since although some of you are my former students out there, I noticed from the signups, uh, not all of you may know, know me. So just a quick word of introduction, a few things. Um, as Greg said, I'm a professor of law. I'm also an architect not associated with the Art Vandalay firm. Um, I was born in Houston, uh, which is the land of no zoning. And perhaps ironically, as Greg pointed out, I also chair a uh, Cities Planning and Zoning Commission here in Hartford, Connecticut, which is where I'm based. I am Mexican American. I'm really proud of the urbanities up. And you can follow me with scheduled tweets on Twitter, Sarah Bronin, and there's my for. Greg alluded to this in his opening remarks, but I also want to acknowledge uh, my call in pebble weeks of silence, especially given uh, the week's event out about the show. 
So we recognize there are no major black characters in this show. Uh, in a way, black life is not portrayed uh, in any meaningful way. And there are some instances, uh, including uh, some instances that uh, Jessica Ruff has pointed out, episodes like the Cigar Store Indian and the Wizard, where uh, she calls it uh, mocking the hypocrisy of whiteness, but uh, you know that that uh, there's something underlying some of the attitudes and views that were portrayed in the show. So I just wanted to recognize that first thing right out of the gate. Uh, we know what kind of show we're talking about today, um, but we also need to keep in mind that you know what we want to talk about as legal scholars is really how the legal issues presented in this show help us understand ourselves, perhaps as a mirror to ourselves, a reflection of American. Uh, ideas about property, ideas about uh, cultural values, um, and to, to use it to, to kind of advance our understanding of law and each other. So uh, I'll also be speaking a little bit later in the presentation, let me just find my uh, advanced button here, uh, about how property law helps perpetuate racism and what we might be able to do about it. So with that introduction, I'm going to just repeat this urge to uh, explore the one is what is property law? So we're talking about we talk about this area of law. I know there are some lawyers on the phone, some law students on the on the on the phone or on the call, uh, and then also uh, just members of our broader community. So let's just all get on the same page about what property law is. Then we're going to talk about what can be owned. And then what is ownership? And throughout, I'm just gonna sprinkle some lessons because I'm a property professor after all, I've narrowed them down to five lessons. And these are the things I really want you to take with you as you move on from today's webinar into the world and, and, and hopefully more knowledgeable about property law. All right, so let's get started. So the first big question I wanted to address is what is property law? So it's not uh, a show about nothing. It's, it's not a law about nothing. In fact, I would argue uh, as a property law scholar that it is the law of everything. The reason is, and this is what I tell my first year students in my property class every day, is that law governs human relationships and their relationships to things, to legal things. So in doing that, Property law really affects all of society, all of culture, our entire economy. The rights and obligations that are allocated through property law have profound impacts and they govern our daily lives. I would also argue, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, that property law creates winners and losers. So the very first lesson right out of the gate here is property law is fundamental. And by fundamental, I mean fundamental to the way we organize ourselves as a society and fundamental to the way we relate to each other. In my property law class, and this is always a first year class and I love teaching property and I love the first years uh, that, that I've taught. Um, these are the really basic questions that we start out with. What is, uh, what is a property? In other words, what can be owned? And then what is the nature of ownership? There's a whole other list of topics that we cover in property law. Of course, we're not gonna be able to consider them today. They include the shared estates, estates and land and the dreaded rule against perpetuities for the practicing lawyers out there. Um, title issues, servitudes like easements and covenants and land use laws, including zoning laws, which I will touch on at the very end of this presentation. And of course, the big one is the Blackstonian bundle of sticks, how we allocate rights in property once we know somebody has a right in property, their right to use, to exclude, to transfer, and so on. But again, most of this I won't be able to talk about today. We're just going to focus on these first two basic questions. All right, so the first question uh, is what can be owned? And by that, I mean, what is property? How do we think about the law in relation to the things that the law gives rights uh, in and sometimes obligations for? So I put a little tagline here. It's very refreshing. You'll see why in a moment. So what can be owned? So there's a lot of different scenarios where you might come to own something or where you might 
uh, see ownership as being an essential question or issue. So first one here that I have, you find a quarter on the ground. The, that really invokes property law and the rights of finders, finders keepers, right? This is uh, the, the uh, adage that we hear and in fact has been enshrined into property law to some extent. You buy a house, of course, property law plays a role here. You get divorced, property law plays a role in the division of assets. Who gets what? What are they uh, secure in receiving after a divorce? Are there rights to future earnings as well? The law is what answers these questions. Also, you might donate an organ. That act, that act of donation suggests that you had property rights in the organ. You might use a mobile device, maybe one that's owned by your work. So it, you have some temporary ownership and use rights over that mobile device, but there's a little bit more complication here and property law addresses that because your work is the one that ultimately owns your mobile device. And then finally, uh, fighting over the remote control on a daily basis, you may exercise uh, property rights or at least assert property rights within your house when you're trying to watch maybe Seinfeld, maybe some other show. So all of that says that the objects of those actions are property. So some of the things that can be owned, money, houses, future earnings in the case of the divorce, body parts and liquids in your body. We've heard of sperm banks, right? So sperm can be owned. It's something that the body makes. Uh, tangible things like phones and remote controls. And then finally, intangible things. And it's this last category that I wanna focus on. And that brings us to the first case in the assigned readings. And the case is Castle Rock Entertainment versus Carroll Publishing Corp. And uh, I screenshotted the uh, Seinfeld aptitude test that is the subject of this case. So the Seinfeld, let me, before I go to that slide, the Seinfeld aptitude test is a collection of trivia questions about Seinfeld. Now, the book uh, that was released has, I think, almost 700 questions. And here's a couple. And let's see if you can answer these. So first question, to impress a woman, George passes himself off as a gynecologist, a geologist, a marine biologist, or a meteorologist. How many people know the answer to this one? You can put it in the chat if you'd like. Yes, I see lots of raised hands. So we think we probably got this one covered. Probably we got a C, right? Marine biologist. He also does it with architecture too. Hence my reference to the Art Vandelay law, uh, architecture firm. How about this one? What candy does Kramer snack on while observing a surgical procedure from an operating room balcony? Again, here I see lots of hands raised. And now where did I put it? Ah, here it is. It's very refreshing. Junior Mints. These are actually heart-shaped. You can get these on Amazon, apparently, which is what I did. I'm going to have one, actually. All right, so that's what he snacks on while observing a surgical procedure. Mmm, it is very refreshing. All right, so what does this have to do with law? The creators of the Seinfeld aptitude test were not the same people that owned the copyright in the TV show. So the owners of the TV show, uh, the, the copyrights in the TV show, the ideas and the creative work uh, fixed in the tangible medium of video uh, decided that they would sue the creators of the Seinfeld aptitude test, uh, which was being sold for profit uh, and it was entirely about Seinfeld for a copyright violation. Now looking at copyright law, this is a federal law and it protects, and you see the quotes here, original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. The court describes the show, as you see here, the series revolves around the petty tribulations of four single adults in New York, and goes through the Seinfeld aptitude test to say how much, to, to evaluate how much of the show itself was captured or taken by the makers of the Seinfeld aptitude test. We'll just call it the SAT. In copyright law, there is an exception for fair use. Now, in order to uh, prove that you have fairly used material, 
you have to show that uh, favorable uh, to your side uh, and uh, or produce a good argument in, in regard to all of these four factors. So the purpose and character of the secondary use, the nature of the copyrighted work, in other words, the nature here of the SAT, the amount and substantiality of the portion that the second work used, and the effect of the use on the potential market. So again, if you're a law student or lawyer, you're always, uh, you, you may remember back to the exams that you took uh, last semester or maybe 20 years ago and say, oh yes, the multi-factor test. What do you have to do with a multi-factor test? Well, you have to evaluate the facts against each one. And that's what this court did. So the court says, with regard to the purpose and character of this use, what did this book really do? Well, the court says the book really just repackaged the show Seinfeld for fans in a different medium. It wasn't video this time, but it was a trivia book that essentially took the show, the facts of the show, the creativity of the original creators and just repackaged it for, for fans. So when it comes to the purpose and character of the use, the court said, uh, this, is, this is really going, uh, uh, in, this factor is really going in favor of the creators of Seinfeld. Similarly, the nature of the copyrighted work, and these two are somewhat related. So what is the nature of the SAT? Is it truly transformative? Uh, it, was it a parody? Was it something else that, that, that made it uh, into, did, did the makers of the SAT make the, their work into something more than just the show? And here the court says, it's not really transformative. It doesn't take the show and turn it into something else, which is allowed under this fair use doctrine. Then looking at the amount and substantiality of uh, what was used of the original work. The court says here too, the creators of the SAT essentially stole all of the entire episode, all of the episodes and dumped them into this one book. And so the proportion of the creative content that they stole was, was very high. And again, this cuts in favor of the original makers of Seinfeld. And then finally, the effect of the use on the potential market. So the court says, well, we acknowledge that not everybody who is going to be buying the SAT is going to not watch Seinfeld as a result. In fact, it's probably a correlation between Seinfeld watchers who, by their viewership, are providing the creators of Seinfeld with income. Uh, as it, So that was a long uh secondary phrase, but it's very likely that the people who are watching Seinfeld are the people buying this book. So there's not really a diminution in market value. But what they said was, although the creators of Seinfeld, Castle Rock, had not evidenced a, a real desire to uh, create books like this, we shouldn't close them off from this market because they're really the ones that own the content. So in the end, the court says the makers of the SAT lose the uh, Makers of Seinfeld win, Seinfeld TV, Castle Rock, they own the rights to their ideas and they can do exactly what the bakers of the SAT did if they wanted to. They don't have to to assert the rights in being able to make a trivia book like this derived from their current work. All right, so lesson number two, we're talking about all the different types of things that can be owned in property law. Ideas have owners or let's say certain ideas have owners, ideas can be owned. And there's a whole subset of property law, intellectual property law, which covers trademarks and uh, copyrights and patents and trade secrets and other ideas that have found protection in the law. All of that is part of our property law. All right, next category, what is ownership? And here I gave you a little sneak peek here. It's my parking space. How do you show ownership? So ownership in the law can be verified in a number of ways. So let's say title is perhaps the most obvious way. Look at your deed to your house or maybe even a, a written document uh, that is your lease to the apartment that you live in. A written title can be for, referred to broadly here as really a written document that proves ownership. And that is the case when it comes to real property the majority of the time. Another way to prove ownership is signage. You might in some search situations, and we'll talk about one of those in a moment, be able to post a sign to something and in that way indicate that you own it. 
third way, a discovery. So this is a potentially problematic uh, theory of ownership uh, that is that really arose in property law when uh, European colonists were fanning out across the United States and acting as if they discovered land. It was under this discovery theory that they uh, were able to receive title to properties, uh, of course, properties that Native Americans had lived on for thousands of years. And this is one of the great embarrassments of our country, uh, the great injustices of our country, and um, something that property law um, should reckon with, but maybe never will. But anyway, this theory of discovery that you've discovered something works in the real property context. It also works in the context of patents. If you've discovered uh, a new process or a new method or, or uh, even put things together to make a new machine, uh, that discovery is also rewarded and can lead to ownership rights. Creation, similarly, the creation of the idea of Seinfeld, that creation lends itself to uh, receiving pri uh, property rights in copyright law. Uh, but the thing I wanted to talk about today, and again, we're sort of, I'm giving you the broad and then I'm narrowing down to the topics that I think we'll be able to, to cover in the next uh, little bit. Uh, the thing I want to talk about today is possession because it is through possessing something that you might actually be able to show you own it. On that note, you might ask, what is possession? So one definition for possession is what you see on the screen. Effective control over a thing and a manifested intent to maintain certain control to the exclusion of others. All right, so maintaining this control, effective control, exclusion of others. Where did I get this definition? So I'm part of a group of scholars uh, who, through the auspices of the American Law Institute, is helping to uh, restate all of property law. And here we are uh, working together. Um, there's a, a, an image of the American Law Institute. I'm very proud to be part of, this, part of this effort. And what we are trying to do is systematically restate all of property law. That means taking judicial opinions, taking uh, really great uh, law scholarship, and distilling them down into a few black letter law principles that judges can then later reference to sort of say, this is what this legal principle really is or should be. So again, that's a very uh, nutshell version of what a restatement is, but it was through the restatement where we recently proposed, and my fellow reporters recently proposed uh, this definition. So I'm gonna point back to this and say, the three things that we thought were very important were this effective control, manifested intent, and exclusion of others. So let's see how this plays out. But first I'll, I'll talk about lesson three, I'll highlight lesson three. Possession is usually black and white. So usually you either own something or you don't. You either possess something or you don't. There's no question that I possess these junior mints, which are very refreshing. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, so there's no question, they're mine. I own them, I'm holding them, they're mine. But what about this, the parking space? So hopefully when you went through the syllabus, you got a chance to glimpse at this episode again and maybe even this critical scene that we'll be talking about today. I am going to go through the script. I'm not a very funny person, but I'm gonna to try to read through this and give you a sense of what the characters are talking about if you haven't uh, had a chance to go through it in the last 24 hours. So the situation arises when Jerry invites some people over to his house, George is headed to his house and Jerry's friend Mike is also headed to his house. So this is what happens. And I'll just I'll, I'll point, point you there. They both see this parking space and here we go. George says, you can't do that. You can't just sneak in from the back like that. Mike says, I'm not sneaking. I didn't even know you were parking. You were just sitting there three spaces up. George, if you didn't think I was parking, why did you put it in head first? Mike, that's the way I park. George, the point is I was here first. Mike, I was closer to the space than you were. And finally, George. Are you gonna move the car? Mike, I'm not gonna move the car. Later, George says, I am not putting this in a garage. It's my space. All right, 
So now we're on the same page. Going back to this question, how do you show ownership? Title, signage, possession, reminding ourselves what is possession, effective control, manifested intent, exclusion of others. So looking at that script and that set of facts in the image from the show, what do you think about who has possession? Let's go through each of the factors. And again here, each of the, each of the components rather of the definition of possession. Again here, this is what lawyers do. We break down a truth, a black letter principle here, the definition of possession. And we say, how do the facts apply to these principles, these components? All right, so effective control. Do either of them really have effective control over the parking space? So George, he kind of waited too long to assert effective control. If you were actually saw the whole scene, you would have seen that George was bragging to Elaine about how good he was at parking, rubbing his hands together, saying, I wish there was a prize in parallel parking. Meanwhile, he's so far up that Mike tries to go in heads first. But then there's the question about Mike's claim to the space. Is his claim really legitimate? So George says, you can't just back, you can't just sneak in from the back. But the effective control question, I think, it's not really clear who has control over this space physically. They're both more or less equally within the space. How about manifested intent? Well, this they both have. Both have manifested an intent to stay in the space. I'm not gonna move my car. I'm not gonna move my car. We're all, we're, we have a clear intent. And again here, they've both expressed exclusion. So it's one or the other. You Either one gets a space or they don't. You, you can't share a parking space, especially not in New York City. So how do you go about resolving this dispute? And this is where, again, thinking like a lawyer comes in. So lawyers always look to precedents. They always look to cases decided before the immediate question at hand. And they look to whether the facts are the same. They look to whether the reasoning is the same. And then of course they look to whether the outcome is the same. I'm just gonna give you two precedents that I always talk about on the first day of property to see what you think about how we should resolve this case. The first one is Pearson versus Post. So this is a case about the fox, uh, about a fox. And this is an old case and made much more famous than, uh, you know, than anything because it's in every single property law case book. Uh, it's about two hunters on an, on, on an uninhabited, unowned beach. They are both in pursuit of the same fox. One hunter has spent many hours chasing after the fox, tiring this fox, putting a lot of labor into the hunt. The next guy, Post, uh, comes in at the very end of the hunt, swoops in and actually does kill the fox, but only after the first guy, Pearson, tired out the fox. So the question for the court at that time is who do we, re who do we reward? Do we reward the person who tires the fox or the person who actually reduces the fox uh, to, to uh, property by killing it? It's a wild animal here, so, so by killing it. Uh, the second case is Gen versus Rich. And again here, dealing with a wild animal, dealing with a whale back when uh, Americans did kill whales. Uh, whales are a common theme today, as you'll see in a moment, not just in our logo. Um, all right, so but the whales, uh, so Gen versus Rich, it, it, at that time, uh, it, in, in the case at hand, there was a person who had harpooned the whale and then a person who, so, so I guess the, the thing that you might need to know is once you've harpooned a whale, you don't just bring the whale in on your boat, apparently. The whale kind of has to sink and then float back up and then be carried to the shore by waves. And then at that point, you can go and you... Um, you retrieve the whale and its parts and, and all of that. So there's a multi-step process to uh, killing whales. And in any event, there's roles for both the person who harpooned the whale and a role for the person who finds the whale on the beach and makes sure that the person who harpoons the whale knows where it is. And uh, that person, the marker uh, by custom gets a certain share of profits. So in looking at those two cases, the case of the wild animal, the case of the fox, one thing is clear about both of these cases. And that is that 
the courts decide based on custom in hunting foxes and hunting whales in both situations. And if you think about a parking space as like a wild animal, it's uh, res nullius in a way, it's unowned, although of course we know it's the city that owns the land under the parking space. If you have an open parking space, it is somewhat like a wild animal if you make that analogy. And then you go forward and say, well, in both of these wild animal cases, custom is key. Then the real question that you have to ask is what is the custom in parking? Is the custom that you see somebody who's in front backing in and you assume that that person is entitled to the space or is the custom uh, first come first serve, you get your nose in, then you get the parking space. Well, how many people think uh, custom favors George? I see hands, lots of hands raised for this one. I think if we're thinking like a lawyer and looking at property law and looking at the wild animal cases, which favored custom, we would say George is probably the winner here. So we're on to lesson number four. Property law often reflects social norms. Again, we'll come back to this one. Side note before we do. So uh, although we were talking about a, uh, a parking space, uh, it's important to note, as I did just a moment ago, that no private party really owns the street. The street is uh, owned by the city, uh, usually uh, sometimes owned by the state. Uh, there might be right of ways additionally over private property, but in any event, the street itself is what you might call contested public space in a way. Um, I did want to mention that we are seeing a lot of contested public space issues this week, and a lot of these are property issues. Who has the right to be birding in Central Park? Who has the right to protest on public property? Who has the right to tear down publicly owned statues that are outrageous in what they represent? These are actually questions for property law. Specific though to contested streets, uh, in my opinion, this is my opinion, uh, parking lanes are better than drive lanes, but really what we should be doing in, and New York is starting that uh, during COVID-19 and we're seeing it around the country, is converting our car dominant culture uh, to a culture where we embrace multimodal transportation. And that includes transit, it includes biking, it includes walking, it's better for our cities, our health, our planet, end of public service announcement, but I couldn't let the parking space episode go without saying those things. Now we're gonna get into who owns the golf ball. Okay, just kidding. Let's be serious. What we're going to talk about now is the marine biologist episode. And while we're not gonna talk about who owns the golf ball, we are going to talk about uh, the meaning of a word that is debated in Seinfeld and that was recent, uh, that was involved in a recent uh, case. That case is Maka Indian tribe versus Quileute uh, Indian tribe. And again, it's a case about the meaning of words. It involved a treaty uh, 150 years ago established between a couple of tribes and the United States. And the treaty allowed the tribes to take fish, the right of taking fish, the modern question that was raised by uh, tribes and actually two competing tribes in this case was whether the right of taking encompassed whales and seals. So does fish include whales and seals? Now, what does this have to do with Seinfeld? Well, if you remember the marine biologist episode, George says, I'm such a huge whale fan. These marine, marine biologists were showing how they communicate with each other with these squeaks and squeals. What a fish. Jerry says, it's a mammal. George says, whatever. He doesn't care. So we know from modern science, or we classify whales and seals in modern science as mammals. But what this court says is that US law has to look at what the uh, Indian tribe understood the meaning of the treaty to be at the time. And so for that, in order to understand this word fish, 
they went back and looked at several different sources. They cited the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. They re reminded uh, the, uh, the they, they recalled how uh, the tribe used the word pish, which apparently refers to potentially all different types of food. Uh, and they also noted that the practice of the tribe, again, here the custom, was actually to continue to hunt whales and seals after the treaty. Quoting Seinfeld in footnote number one, uh, the court hands another victory to George. And the reason I bring this up, by the way, is not just because we included this uh, episode in the logo, uh, but also because it really talks about lawyers' responsibility to understand, uh, to understand and be able to argue about the meaning of words. So there's a lot of different contexts here, practice, a dictionary, uh, a translation uh, that could have given meaning to the word fish. Uh, Seinfeld, I presume, was not uh, the uh, the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. I assume that these other factors were more important than footnote one, but perhaps we'll have to ask the judge. All right, so now I'm gonna return back to what I said uh, a moment ago, property lesson number four, and how property law encompasses social norms. And again, you know, especially given all that's going on out there, I couldn't help but just make sure that we all acknowledge that sometimes social norms that property law reflects are not good. Uh, they're not positive social norms. They're not simply about a foxing industry or a whaling industry, but sometimes they pre reflect prevailing attitudes at the time. And property law uh, itself has a number of uh, very sorted, uh, sorted past uh, in a variety of ways. The most prominent of ways, of course, is slavery, at a time at which the United States law, property law, allowed for property rights in people. Of course, we all recognize today that that social norm, that dominant norm is no longer acceptable. Uh, but of course, even still today, property law uh, helps to enshrine what might be dominant views. So we may have also heard, you may have also heard about the story of Henrietta Lacks and who owned her biological material. She was an African American woman uh, and a large medical institution. Uh, retrieved some of her uh, genetic material and used that in experiments. And the question was, did she own it? Does she deserve compensation? How do we treat uh, her material, uh, herself, essentially herself um, in the law? And similarly, land use segregation. And there's a great organization here called Connecticut Open Communities Alliance. Um, they're tackling this issue, but this is a map uh, that you can find on their website about uh, redlining here in Hartford, where I live. The red uh, part is the Hartford part. Uh, Hartford is a central city of 18 square miles, uh, predominantly uh, 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 people of color. And the surrounding areas to the west are uh, fairly uh, well, uh, could, uh, could, uh, <laughs> fairly well considered by the banks that made these maps, and uh, we see today that those are the affluent areas, uh, predominantly white areas, uh, and uh, high property value areas. And so, these this legacy of how we've treated our property has ramifications into today. So, I would say all of property law has this issue. And I will say number five here today, uh, property law reflects gender and racially dominant views, but it doesn't have to. And so I did want to make just a quick plug today about uh, some things that are happening here in Hartford, uh, where you just saw the map, uh, including the zoning commission that I chair. So in Hartford, we've upended all of our land use laws and rewritten them entirely to create a more equitable and sustainable city. I'm really proud of that. Uh, this is the commission uh, at the top and, and some of our staff members. Uh, we've also just done a city plan and that was in collaboration with 2,300 people and meeting after meeting in all neighborhoods in the city. A very diverse uh, group of people who uh, told us what their views were and tried to make sure that we enshrine those in the most important local property law that there is and that is zoning and land use law. So oh, here's some more of our, our meetings for the city planning process. 
And also this week, we just learned that we were awarded uh, the best zoning code in the country award by Smart Growth America and the Form Based Codes Institute. So I'm especially proud of that because it shows that you can toss out antiquated, outdated, uh, socially non-beneficial zoning rules and usher in a totally new era and a totally new code and um, that people recognize that. So I encourage you, uh, I'll expand lesson number five here. Property law reflects gender and racially dominant views, but doesn't have to. It's a great day to change the conversation. So I encourage you and your communities, uh, you may not be able to completely change all of property law at the state level, but when you think of property law in places you can make change, it might start with zoning, your zoning boards, your elected officials. All right, so with that, I think we have uh, a little bit of time for questions and I'll turn it back over to uh, Anthony and uh, maybe you'll be able to, I think there are some questions in the Q&A, so I will just turn it back over to you if you are unmuted. All right, great. So we've got a few questions here and if you all uh, have questions, you can send them in the Q&A or you can type them up on Twitter using the yada yada law hashtag. All right, so uh, the first question we've got is under the fair use protection, what is the degree that the law school can use clips purportedly for an educational purpose and without the benefit of a tuition? Oh, you mean, does this presentation violate copyright? So we, we've made a choice here not to play clips of Seinfeld itself. Is that the nature? Is that how you read the question, Anthony? I think so. I think it's yeah. pretty on the nose. <laughs> yeah. So that's a great question. And, and one of the reasons to kind of tackle this Castle Rock case is to illustrate the differences between the factors in that case as they might be applied uh, to this very webinar. So we've made a choice not to play any of the videos. Uh, the scripts are available and you, know, you can see them yourself and paraphrase them um, online. Uh, the nature of this work is, uh, the purpose of this work is, is educational. The purpose of this work is to educate about property law about, and includes intellectual property law. Um, the uh, character of this work is again, educational. It is nonprofit in nature, although we are asking for uh, you know, if you if you would like donations to the New York uh, Legal Services through our website, but it's not uh, profitable for us. I hope that uh, there's not an episode out there in Seinfeld that covers uh, this exact lecture in a line by line. But unlike the SAT book, which takes all of the facts and all of the characters and simply repackages them, we hope that this series uh, ends up transforming and raising questions about some of the activities and characters and scenarios that we see in Seinfeld uh, and puts them in a legal context using our legal analysis to, to help uh, transform it into something else. And uh, then the last factor, the amount of substantiality that's used. I mean, again, you know, you, you saw a couple of images, but there was an awful lot of slides here that were not uh, not necessarily related to Seinfeld, but were meant to illustrate the broader points that were raised. So I think, uh, you know, and again, I guess I'm being recorded and this is all out there for the world now. I think it's a great question, but I think that there are sufficient differences if you're thinking like a lawyer and thinking about precedents between the nature of this presentation and something that's commercially used, commercially available, and that repackages all of uh, the entire series for profit uh, and doesn't transform it in any way. So I hope uh, that anybody out there thinks that this is transformative uh, and uh, not, com not commercially used and certainly not cutting into profits and not something that the creators of Seinfeld would have done themselves. I don't know, Anthony, do you have anything to add? I'm way out of my field. Uh, <laughs> we, do, we do have a follow-up question from, from another uh, participant that, that asked, you know, would it make a big, would it make a difference um, if tuition was charged or, you know, is the educational nature really the, the gravamen of the analysis? So again, that's a great question. And so if you look at the, the, the nature of the work, you know, that, that may be the nature of this series, you know, is it for profit? Is it attempting to cut into 
uh, the, the prophets of uh, the, the makers of Seinfeld, it doesn't seem like this is the kind of thing that they would do. So potentially, even if we did charge, um, maybe a court would still say that we're not cutting into, uh, into their business, into the things that they would normally do. If you remember from the Castle Rock case, the court said, this, we know that the SAT is not cutting into their profits probably, but we think that the creators of Seinfeld might one day put out a trivia book. I'm not sure the crea creators of Seinfeld will, will one day put out a, a legal seminar like this. So hopefully it doesn't make a difference, but we're not charging and we don't intend to. And in fact, we we all like the show and encourage you to watch it. So so, so related to the SAT uh, book, there's a question that the book title clearly plays on the SAT. So could the college board or the, the administrators of the SAT have made some kind of copyright infringement claim against the book or the publisher, or does that meet some kind of transformative test enough for it to be allowable? Oh, that's another good one. I, you know, I, I think you could apply the same factors and try to figure out whether uh, the makers, the college board, the makers of the real SAT, so to speak, would ever be thought to be likely to put out a book like this or whether the other issue might be the likelihood of confusion. Something else we didn't talk about in, uh, in copyright. It, dep it depends on whether the, uh, I, I, the term might be trademarked rather than copyrighted. Um, and so under trademark analysis, you would look under this question of, is it likely that somebody would be confused when they saw a college board SAT prep book versus a Seinfeld aptitude test book and buy the Seinfeld book instead of the college board book. And you know, somehow uh, that would eat into the college board's um, uh, uh, mark in that case. So again, I have, I not, can't, don't know the top of my head whether SAT is trademarked, I assume it is. Um, so then we get out of copyright law and into trademark law, which is a different area of intellectual property law if you are uh, take a, a law student or uh, in law school, you know, going into law school or in law school now, intellectual property law is a great course to take. So we have a question about how courts evaluate uh, what customs are. So we have, the question is, when, when a court is evaluating a custom, what sources do they look to? So do judges look to expert testimony or do they look somewhere else to figure out what the custom might be? Sure, so that's a great question. And what they look at is whatever the lawyers bring them. And so again, here, you're talking about a lawyering question and good lawyering will mean finding all of the sources that will support the side that you wanna argue for. There are cases and situations where people will say, people will be arguing about what the custom is. And you can see that, especially in these historical cases, you know, the law as it has evolved today, there are some principles that may have been decided by courts before there were statutes that were adopted by legislatures or local government bodies or the Congress. Um, so some legal questions may have been decided by courts and, and in those cases, custom may have come into play. When you're talking about a statute, a law that is written on the books and um, administered and uh, enforced by or administered by legislative bodies, then you're really talking about um, you know the, the the situations where the legislature has decided what is. So it's judge-made law where we see custom, and that's when I say you know that's it, what they decide depends on what lawyers bring them. So it might be historical narratives, it might be artwork, it might be firsthand accounts, it might be data, it might be video in this day and age. You know, what, what are people doing? It might be internet searches. How do people use a certain term? And actually, uh, you know, th that, that question comes up in, in intellectual property law, just like in, in other cases. What, how have people come to use certain things? Um, you know, for example, uh, the term Kleenex. Oh, there's a great, uh, is it Kleenex? I just, uh, one of my students just sent me a great video about uh, trademark Velcro, it's Velcro. You have to look this up. It's the Velcro trademark uh, video. It's on YouTube, it's about three minutes long. And what they do is they say, please don't start calling any hook and loop system Velcro 
they say you have to call it a hook and loop system because the more Velcro turns into a customary usage for a hook and loop attachment system, the less, the, the harder it is for the company who holds the trademark in Velcro to keep that trademark and to keep that mark. So, you know, the cu custom, if, you know, it seems like folks are interested in IP law, intellectual property law, uh, custom and, and usage and word usage has, has a role to play too in that context. And part of that is how we use words. Kleenex, for example, and Band-Aids are two examples of, of trademarks that have all but lost their meaning because of the common usage. So we have a question about custom and how it's used outside of animal cases. So the question is, to what extent do courts defer to custom beyond cases like wild animals? Are there any major cases that come to mind where a ruling radically uh, contravenes our social customs about property? Oh, where a ruling radically contravenes. Oh gosh, I hadn't thought about this one. Um, Certainly there are situations where custom has been ignored. And uh, so I'll give you an example that does have to do with <clears throat> what might be considered an unowned object and that is a baseball. So um, there was a F Barry Bonds, so if you, people know Barry Bonds, the baseball player. Um, he was at his height, uh, his home runs were, at, as he was approaching the record number of home runs, uh, people were watching him and, and trying to go to get, they would go to games, they would try to catch the ball. There's a property law case called Popoff versus Hayashi that deals with a situation where the ball is caught by one party. Uh, it, well, the one party catches the ball and the crowd jostles the ball out of his hands and the ball is then caught firmly and exclusive control by someone else. So under the traditional or customary rule of baseball, it's usually whoever catches a fly ball. It's an unowned object once it flies into the air. Major League Baseball's uh, professional uh, opinion or, or I guess uh, custom is that they allow any fan who has secured the ball uh, caught the ball to keep the ball. This is different from the NFL, where if a football goes into the stands, um, the NFL officials go and get the football back. In baseball, it's different. So you can consider a fly ball or a home run ball that has been hit a kind of unowned object, like a wild animal. So the custom is whoever secures it gets it. Well, in that case, because one person, and this is an expensive ball, because one person had gotten some control over it, and the other person had secured it, it was unclear sort of how this, this rule might be applied. So if you just took the custom, literally it might be the second guy, it might be the guy that held it and got it, um, but it went to court and the court had an unusual remedy bucking the property law general rule that there is one winner and one owner. And in that case, Popoff versus Hayashi, uh, the court said, you both own the ball. Now, what were they gonna do with the ball? Were they gonna saw it in half and each take one? No, the logical thing to do with the ball was to auction it off. And so they, they eventually did auction it off. They got less money for it than they thought they would have. One of the guys, I can't remember which one, um, paid his lawyer on contingencies. So the lawyer only got uh, some percentage, I think of the proceedings. The other guy paid his lawyers by the hour. All of that guy's money that he won went to pay the lawyers. And I think they even sued him for some more. So that's an example of a court taking, a, you know, what would be a customary treatment perhaps in baseball um, and ownership of baseball and saying, we're going to do something totally different here. Uh, we're going to split the baby and not really no one was happy with that result. We have a lot of great questions, but I'm going to try to narrow it down to about two more. So we give you time to answer them. Um, but we got two different questions about uh, some of your work in Hartford. So I'll try to combine them. Um, so we have a question about, you know, whether uh, z so zoning and lack thereof has a huge impact, uh, environmental impact on a city. Um, and, and our participant thinks about Houston and Detroit in particular. Um, has work been implemented in Hartford um, that focuses on environmental, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, specifically, um, or rather than just broader social impacts. And relatedly, there's another question about, you know, one thing, you know, asking you about one particular measure that Hartford adopted that uh, you think has been particularly effective in, in um, you know, 
bringing about social equity. So I'll throw that at you. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So the first answer, yes, there's been a lot of work that we've done on climate. So um, I, with the help of some of my students and actually students from a lot of area educational institutions, uh, Hartford adopted in 2018, a citywide climate action plan. So we, in 2016, we overhauled that zoning code. And I would argue that our code is probably the most environmentally sustainable in the country. Because when we went around and asked people what they wanted most, they didn't say, I'm an environmentalist. You know, I, I, you know, they didn't sort of lay it out there like that, but they said, why is there a landfill in my neighborhood? You know, why can't I, why, why is this use allowed to locate next to me? Um, you know, why are there so many cars? Why do we all have asthma? Why aren't there um, complete streets? And so they, they're really all, we're talking about health and environmental issues and environmental health issues together. Um, so in 2016, we took everything that we heard, we put as much as we could in the zoning code. And then we went through this whole separate process to do a climate action plan. That's online at hartford.gov slash climate. And it covers the gamut of energy, food, uh, transportation, waste, water, and landscape. And it has three overarching values, social equity, economic development, and uh, public health. And so, you know, th that action plan was awesome. And we got a grant funded sustainability office for it. And we're really working hard with a lot of community partners on that uh, to make, see that climate action plan become a reality. We incorporated all of that into a 2020 city plan where a fifth of the plan was about green, was about sustainability. And again, it's just become part of the city. It's become part of who we are. We are an environmentally, we, we are seeking environmental justice and you can get that through the zoning code as well as through good planning. All right, so second question was, what is the one thing that you've done here? The number one thing to advance equity and to create a better city is that we have ended minimum parking requirements. So it's ironic that I've uh, given you this parking space episode as, my, as the episode that I chose, uh, because here we are all about um, ending the dominance of the car. Um, so if you look at, at, so Hartford is the first city in the country to completely eliminate minimum parking requirements for any use. So what does that mean? So usually when you build an apartment building, they'll say two zoning, two parking spaces for every apartment unit that you build. Who pays for those parking spaces? The end users. So what a parking requirement does is it makes apartments, it makes offices, it makes everything more expensive and it passes those costs on to the end users who in turn are forced through the law to subsidize driving. Now, nobody knows this topic better than Greg Schill, who has written, a, our or, fearless organizer, our dean, um, who has written about a, a great article called How the Law Subsidizes Driving, and you should read it. But one really important piece of this is zoning codes all around the country require people to build spaces for cars. If we can reverse that and just say, we don't care, we're gonna put a maximum on the number of spaces of cars you built, well, we're not gonna put any minimum on it because we're designing for people, not cars. That is the single most important thing that I think we've done because it has environmental benefits. Uh, researchers have shown that more parking spaces equal more driving. It has health benefits um, and it's just gonna make our city better because who wants to look at service parking lots? All right, so we got one more question, but before I, I throw it out there, we just want to remind everybody uh, that the links for uh, the, the COVID relief fund is in the chat. So we hope that you certainly contribute to that. Um, the minimum is $10. So if, if you can throw in $10, we would really appreciate that uh, to help out with COVID relief. Um, I see that there is a question about a great guide for New York City bathrooms. Um, hopefully I can help you out with that next week and I'll, I'll give that some consideration uh, in, in our constitutional law, law lecture, which I'll be giving next week. So we hope you, we hope you come back. Um, but the last question we have is about the, the way in which George uh, in the parking, the, the parking space debate um, may or may not have broken the law. So the question is, um, you know, the, the, or I should say the, the participant says, to my knowledge, George did not use the blinker to indicate his intent to take possession of the parking space. Assuming this is a violation of traffic law, might that come into, in, into play when determining rightful possession of the space? So I actually couldn't tell whether he used the blinker in the episode, but this is a great point. Sometimes uh, it, it, illegitimate, sometimes your, your right to property is delegitimized by 
uh, some action that you might take. So we say in the case of finders keepers, a thief is never a legitimate holder of the object because even though they, they may have found it, they stole it against the law. And so they most anybody else's claim is superior to the thieves in, in finding something. Similarly, you know, if George had broken a traffic law here, you know, what, what would be the impact? Well, the truth is, is that there is no law that I know of uh, that would entitle George to the space uh, from a legal, enforceable, uh, judicial system weighing in on uh, type of perspective. So, uh, you know, again, is that a, it, that's really comes da back down to that question of social norms. If we expect somebody to put a blinker on before they back into a parking space, then maybe they deserve it. If the social norm is uh, different uh, and, and those social norms evolve over time uh, for the good, for the most part, um, you know, then we might expect a different outcome for George. So great question. All right, y'all, so, well, this, this has been fantastic. Uh, yes, yeah, so let me just close by saying it's been a hard week. I wish you all serenity now. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for tuning in. All right. All right. Thanks, y'all. See you next week.